people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India and Australia, both parts of the Quad grouping, are set to sign a harvest trade agreement or interim agreement in next coming weeks with a comprehensive free trade agreement to follow in the next 12 to 18 months. The deal would cover a wide range of sectors and open opportunities for manufacturing, education and jobs in both countries. The decision comes after extensive engagements from both sides at all levels from the top leadership to foreign minister meetings and trade dialogues. New Delhi and Canberra are on the verge of signing an early harvest agreement or an interim agreement for the tax-free trade between the two countries in the next couple of weeks. Indian Trade and Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal said the nuances will be dealt with in the next 30 days. An interim or early harvest trade agreement is used to liberalize tariffs on the trade of certain goods between two countries or trading blocks before a comprehensive free trade agreement is concluded. The trade negotiations between the two received a push after the United States, Australia, Japan and India pledged to set up the Quad Group in response to China's economic and military expansion. The ministers in a joint conference apprised that the agreement will comprise most areas of interest for both countries, including goods, services, rules of origin, sanitary and phytosanitary measures and customs procedures. Both sides have been very, very fair and understanding about the sensitivities that each side has about certain issues. Australia has certain sensitivities, India has certain sensitivities, and the good part of this friendship is that we have respected each other's sensitivities, and the agreement is uh, an agreement which is only a win-win. Australia and India launched negotiations for a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement back in 2011. And in 2020, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Australian counterpart decided to speed up the negotiations for a trade deal while agreeing to resolve some bilateral issues. Bilateral trade between the two countries stood at about $12.5 billion in fiscal year 21 and it has already surpassed $17.7 billion in the first 10 months of fiscal year 22. India has exported merchandise worth about $12.1 billion from Australia in the first 10 months of the fiscal and has exported merchandise worth $5.6 billion in the same period. Key imports from Australia include coal, gold and LNG, while key exports to the country from India include diesel, petrol and gems and jewellery. Addressing fears among India's domestic industry and farmers about a bilateral trade pact with Australia, Goyal said both sides have been fair and understood the sensitivities of each other and the deal would be a win-win. The Quad has just add, added to the strength of, of the relationship and uh, I, I think what we'll see is it will continue to develop and grow and enhance the relationship not only between Australia and India but of all countries of, of the Quad and you know down the track we, we have free trade agreements with the United States, we have one with, with Japan. Uh, my hope is in, in 30 days we will have an announcement with, with India and then we can start to, to build the economic cooperation and, and framework also within the, uh, within the, the countries of, of the Quad. So it's a, a special and, and unique relationship. And It is not just the trade, but India and Australia have committed to enhancing their cooperation at all levels, including the security and the spillover effects of the pandemic. 
Foreign ministers of Australia and India, along with the US and Japanese foreign ministers, had promised to increase cooperation on cyber threats and counterterrorism too last week. The grouping is aimed at countering the challenges posed to the free navigation in the Indo-Pacific due to the growing hegemony and belligerence of China. They committed to bringing words into action here on, and it is expected that the next leadership summit might see a major decision-making at grouping front. Moving on. Six months have passed and the war ravaged Afghanistan hasn't moved an inch forward when it comes to education, employment or women's rights. Several indices that determine the quality of life of people living in a particular country or region have shown a sharp negative growth in Afghanistan's case. While the unemployment rate was high even during Ashraf Ghani government, a large number of previously employed people too are finding it hard to make their ends meet. The rights have gone for a toss and the activists are increasingly worried about women who are yet to see a Taliban version that was promised during the negotiations. A long shot of Kabul streets may deceive you into believing that everything is going fine in the war-ravaged country. The main market bustling with crowds, stalls set up by vendors. However, the ground reality is in sharp contrast with what a camera lens can capture. This week, Kabul marks six months of Taliban's return to power. And the situation has gone from bad to worse. People don't have sustenance options with a large section of Afghan population being pushed into poverty. The West has consciously kept itself away from the situation for the fear that an empowered Taliban might prompt the return of Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. The commoners, however, continue to reel under an everyday growing misery. تفاوتی که شاید شما ای که مرات اسلامی آمده کار باری ترا نیستک دیگه هم اگه چیز فراوان است ولی کار نیستک سابقه شش ماه پیش از شش ماه کار بار بود همه مردم کار بود از هر چیز بود حالا یک کمه کار کاربار مردم بیاد رکن در هر چیز فقر گشنگی و ایترا زیادتر شده رای The central bank funds have been frozen since the Taliban took over the country as foreign forces left in August last year The frozen funding combined with sanctions and a drop-off in development funding have sent the country's economy into free fall, unleashing a humanitarian crisis. Afghanistan's central bank last week had criticized Washington's plan to use half of the bank's 7 billion US dollars in frozen assets on US soil for humanitarian aid and set aside the rest to possibly satisfied lawsuits over the 9-11 attacks. People believe if the United States releases all the frozen funds, then they can hope for change in their present condition and can even have a better future. In the past, we have to say that the United States will be able to get the money back to the United States. We will be able to get the money back to the United States. But if the United States will not get the money back to the United States, we will be able to get the money back. The U.S. freezing of Afghan central bank's assets is widely seen as the primary factor leading to the current economic crisis and humanitarian disaster in the war-torn country of some 39 million people. Some $9.5 billion in Afghan central bank reserves remain blocked abroad and international development support has dried up since then. Donors have sought to use the money as leverage over the Taliban on issues including human rights. Pazay ma az Emirat Islami ami asta ke mo ami nawaqis ya mushkilat ke da Emirat Islami wujud dashta bache baad awal yar rafa kona. Buzrak tarin mushkil ke da Emirat Islami wujud me dashta bache. Masalan, ma qablan guftum ke az tamam akwam Afghanistan baad az ba misl baradar ba misl ya kamatan bepaziran.
Last month, Afghanistan's acting prime minister called for international governments to officially recognize the Taliban administration, saying all conditions had been met. Taliban officials have said they will not repeat harsh rule of the previous Taliban government, toppled by US-led forces in 2001, which banned the most girls' education and forbade women from going out in public without a male guardian. The world, however, is taking Taliban's claims with a pinch of salt and is hesitating to help unless the situation improves at all levels in the country especially against the terrorist groups, which they fear might research if the Taliban have sufficient money in their coffers. Moving on. As Himalayan nation Nepal heads towards normalcy after the Omicron wave, one sector that is finding it hard to recover, despite some of them recording a growth, is Nepal's tourism industry. With a large number of employees losing their jobs, the tourism industry appears to be in tatters. Meanwhile, the government of Nepal, which has been taking all measures to keep COVID at bay, has reopened schools after a one-month gap. The classes are being organized on a daily basis for students above 12 years of age and alternatively for below 12 years. Kamal Raj Singh Suwal started his restaurant in Thamil only days before the COVID-19 pandemic struck the world. His business came to a screeching halt. His outlet, which had gained the reputation of serving one of the best cuisines in the city and would remain filled with both foreign and domestic tourists, plunged into a state of perennially unoccupied space. Travel restrictions coupled with lockdowns and fear among the people is still keeping Suwal out of business. कोविड कोई ताकती है वो कोविड बंदा अली किधर आगाडी मात्रे हो हमले रखने पाए को अब घूमने फिर दे अब ये काम आयो तो अब कोविड को कारण ने कर दाखिले वही जने केरे चेलेरा यहाँ संबंध आए पुगे तो अब जने अब थमेल को गति बीति देख दाखिले जने क्ये करों रो कता जाऊँ वन्नी कुरा को टुंगे छाई ना अब मलाय मात पॉसल, होटल, रेस्टोरेंट, बार, इत्यादि जने इनार लाइफ ने सब ऐसे जने मतलब जने मार्केट न पड़े को मंचे चाहिए ना। The story is not just limited to one off example. The Thamil market, which would remain a buzz with tourists, especially on weekends, is wearing a deserted look for months now, with no light appearing at the end of the tunnel. As per the records of Thamil Tourism Development Council, around 6,000 businesses are registered in Thamil. A survey says around 17% of the tourism enterprises in Nepal have shut down since March 2020. And while big businessmen have accrued huge losses, the smaller ones who are still in the business do not know as to how will they survive the pandemic. 65% of the employees dependent on the tourism industry have already been left unemployed by the pandemic. Meanwhile, the Nepal government is taking measures to help push the resumption of all economic and academic activities. After months of no physical classes, the students are back in school. आज आमी फेरी देरे दिन पसी एक महीना को लगभग ऑनलाइन कक्षा पसी बहुत ही ग्रुप में उपस्थित बायरा पठन पठन शुरू करेगे उसमें यो एक महीना को समय या सभी विद्यार्थी अरले अपनो ऑनलाइन कक्षा उपयोग करना न सके रहे का व्यवस्था में आइले बाई को यो निर्णय या निर्णय लाय लागू कर दे आज बटा आमी बहुत ही कक्षा Though the pandemic restrictions have been relaxed, the COVID-19 Health Crisis Management Coordination Center has made the safety protocol mandatory. 
It has recommended the Interior Ministry, Education Ministry for the arrangement of regular school classes for students above 12 years and on alternate days for those under 12 years. First to report COVID-19 case in South Asia, Nepal has reported nearly a million positive cases thus far with little under 12,000 deaths. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Southeast Asian nations held talks in Cambodia amid divisions in the bloc over how to restore stability in Myanmar after a military coup a year ago with the junta's representative barred from attending the meeting. Cambodia is the current chair of the 10-member association of Southeast Asian nations, which last year unexpectedly blocked Myanmar's military government from joining key meetings over a failure to honor a peace plan agreed with the bloc. Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen had sought to re-engage the junta, but amid friction over the approach, ASEAN excluded Myanmar's military-appointed foreign minister from this week's meeting, which was postponed from January. Besides the junta's foreign minister being barred, some ASEAN members did not travel and attended the meeting virtually after a surge in coronavirus cases in Southeast Asia. The crisis in Ukraine overshadowed a gathering of finance leaders from the world's top 20 economies that kicked off with host Indonesia's president warning now is not the time to create new risks to a fragile global recovery. Joko Vidido urged G20 nations to focus on collaboration to revive a global economy that he said was still shaken from the pandemic. Russia's military presence at Ukraine's borders have led to one of the deepest crises in East-West relations for decades, jolting financial markets and adding to the headwinds facing a global economy still emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic. Analysts, however, warned the diverse membership of the G20, consisting of the United States and its allies, but also rivals China and Russia, may make policy coordination hard. Since 1980, Japanese company Casio has been developing innovative technologies to help musicians further improve their performances. Now the Casio Tone CTS-1000V is featuring new vocal synthesis technology that has the ability to bring words to life with the help of 800 stunning tones and other musical tools. Phrase mode plays the complete lyric based on your desired timing as you hold down the key. By using legato playing, you can change the notes as the phrase plays. This innovative vocal synthesis allows the user to choose from multiple vocalist models and adjust age, vibrato, portamento and other parameters. It can produce choir, robotic sound, vocoder-like textures and can even create a custom vocalist based on an audio recording. NTT Communications is developing robot to manage the function of data center. With many companies moving to DX, the number of data centers is increasing rapidly, thus requiring more reliable management and efficient service delivery. There are a number of subjects like continuous increasing capacity, increased maintenance cost and shortage of staff which needs to be looked after. The developed robots could be brought into use for solving these issues. Face recognition technology has been installed in reception robot. Pre-registered visitor information will be checked. By programming the robot with route in the facility, the robot will guide visitor to the destination. Human being can check and inspect the data center from a distance through a robot's camera. NTT communications allocate robot working to facility detecting, reception and attendance observation. They are available for robot alternative to human work. NTT Communications is developing the most effective and efficient management of data center. It is the mission as a spearhead company of ICT and DX.
moving on. India's southern state of Kerala recently got soaked in the festivities of the famous Attukal Pongala festival. Regarded as the most auspicious occasion for women, the main celebration of the festival takes place at the Attukal Bhagwati temple in Thiruvananthapuram. Have a look. Boats of devotees in Trivandrum city recently congregated at Atukal Bhagwati temple as priests performed rituals of the 10 day long Atukal Pongala festival. Located in the heart of the city, the temple is dedicated to Goddess Bhagwati, who is believed to be an incarnation of Kanaki, the central character of the Tamil epic Sillapatikram. Pongala is the most important festival of the temple and is observed in the Malayalam month of Mukaram or Kumbam, meaning February or March. Devotees thronging the temple were happy to pay their obeisance to the goddess as for the last two years they could not do so due to coronavirus. The grand event is held on the ninth day of the festival when Pongala Mahatsavam takes place. On this day, thousands of women from different parts of Kerala and outside congregate around the temple and prepare pongala, a pudding prepared using rice, jaggery and coconut. They start their preparations after the chief priest lit up the main hearth at the Atakul temple and pass on the fire onto their stoves. Since last year, due to COVID restrictions, women devotees have been performing the Pungala at their respective homes only. They set up a makeshift brick stove in the front yard of their house and prepare the offering with prayers. Some even make sweet delicacies like payasam, tirali and mandaputu for the goddess. From the year I was born, um, I've been seeing the celebrations of Pongala and uh, I've been attending the Pongala festival. But uh, the last two years, due to COVID, COVID restrictions, um, you know, um, uh, friends and relatives who usually come to our place to offer Pongala uh, uh, is not coming. So uh, it's only me and my mother who is offering Pongala. So um, uh, this year there are a few relatives. Uh, also to offer Pongala. So from the next year, we hope that uh, everything will uh, return to its usual, the usual situation and uh, we hope that uh, we could celebrate Pongala as before. The ritual of Pongala Mahatsavam had also made it to Guinea's World Book of Records in 2009 for being the largest all-women religious congregation. As per local legend, this annual festival commemorates the hospitality accorded by women in the locality around Atukal Temple to Kanaki while she was on her way to avenge the injustice meted out to her husband Kovalan after destroying Madurai city. As per the tradition of Attukal Pongala, the women who take part in the festival have to be dressed in new clothes and every item used for cooking the divine Pongala has to be brand new. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.